most commonly held interpretation for Genesis 6, 1 to 4 is called the Sethite view. Maybe you have heard of it. Maybe you haven't. And so the Sethite view is this. And it's been so since approximately the late 4th century AD. And this view states that the sons of God that we see in Genesis 6 here, the sons of God are merely human men from the line of Seth, the righteous line, and that the daughters of men are from the line of Cain, who symbolizes the sinful and rebellious line, which then leads to the notion that these verses are merely speaking about forbidden or unlawful marriage and unions. And so we all know the story of Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. They both bring their offerings to God. God accepts Abel's offering, but rejects Cain's offering. Cain doesn't like that. He's got an issue with that. He freaks out about it. He's angry. He decides, you know what? I can't, I can't handle this. I don't know why God would not accept my offering, but accept my brother Abel's offering. And so he rises up and he kills his brother Abel. And then we see God then takes Cain, sends him to the east, to the land of wandering. And, and then Cain builds a city and has his, begins to create his own ancestral line. Now, Adam and Eve, they then had another son, and they named him Seth. And so we see this, these two lines. You have Adam and Eve, and then Seth now replacing Abel, righteous line. And then you have Cain as the murderer, the first murderer in the Bible, who goes off and he represents the line of rebellion, sin, etc. And so this is why you get these, these two lines here. And so the idea is that the line of Seth was is the godly line and that they were to remain separate and not to intermingle with the ungodly line of Cain. And in Genesis 4.26, there's this interesting verse that can get translated a few different ways. And so depending on how it's translated, it states this. It says people or mankind or humankind or even in the, in the original Hebrew grammar, it can actually refer to Seth says, began to call upon the name of the Lord. And so commentators will then say that thus highlighting this, this separation between Seth's line calling upon the name of the Lord, Cain's line not calling upon the name of the Lord. And so then the flood was then God's judgment on humanity for their failure to remain separate. And so there was this whole, so the entire earth was comprised of the line of Seth, the line of Cain, and they intermingled. And God was like, that's a big no-no, so I'm going to send a flood to wipe everyone out. That's the idea. Now, here are some reasons why that viewpoint just doesn't hold now, again, a lot of people, that's the common evangelical view, interpretation of this text. But as we go through some of these critiques of this viewpoint, you're going to see that, man, like, it's, it's a stretch for, it's a stretch to actually get to that viewpoint. Now, here's the first, here's the first critique. Genesis 4.26 never says that the only people who called on the name of the Lord were from the line of Seth. That idea is imposed on the text. That's You won't find that actually in verses. So how does that viewpoint get there? It's people who hold that viewpoint are interjecting that. They are putting that actually into the text. It doesn't say that. Number two, this view does a terrible job at explaining who the Nephilim were. And so I think this is one of the main reasons why this viewpoint doesn't hold any water. 
because it does a horrible job at actually describing and explaining who this Nephilim or who these Nephilim are. Because clearly there's something unique and distinct about them. Uh, these are the, the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of man. They commingle. So in their view, they're, they're just human babies. But if, if, if the sons of God and the daughters of men were just the godly line of Seth and the rebellious line of Cain, and they just had normal human babies, why aren't they just called human babies? Why are they then given this term called the Nephilim, which when you keep reading in the Bible, when you get to the book of Numbers, the Nephilim are mentioned again, and they are looked at as the giants. They're not looked at as just normal human babies. So they have... They, they do a terrible job at actually explaining who the Nephilim were. Number three, the text refrains from referring to the women in the episodes as daughters of Cain. It doesn't say daughters of Cain. It says daughters of mankind. And the text does not establish a direct connection to Cain. There's no link there in the text connecting the daughters of mankind to specifically Cain. And then consequently, the Sethite interpretation of the text is substantiated by an element absent from the text itself, contradicting the principles of exegesis. So there's no link there. And so again, this idea is, is imposed onto the text. Sumran had an idea and they're like, we got to run with this. And so we're going to put it into the text and make it say what we want it to say. Number four, there is no command in the text concerning marriages or any prohibition against marrying certain people. I'm not going to find that in this particular text. That idea is, again, incorrectly just put in the text. You see the theme here. A lot of this stuff a lot of these ideas, they're literally put into the text. You won't actually find them there. And then fifthly, and I think this is the big one. This is the one that I think trumps them all. Nowhere in the Bible is anyone from the line of Seth ever referred to as the Son of God. Nowhere will you find that, where you'll see the term Seth being connected or referred to as a son of God. In fact, every time that the phrase son, sons of God, B'nai ha Elohim, that phrase is used in the Hebrew Bible. It is speaking about divine beings. Every time it is never used in the Hebrew Bible of speaking about human beings. Not to mention even more specifically, the line of Seth. Never, not once. So ultimately, you, you, you take all those five, and, and there's more critiques to that viewpoint, but these are five kind of main ones that are there. And ultimately, when you take all that data and you put it together, it just does not hold any water. So much of these viewpoints, you're having to actually put those ideas into the text. You're not going to pull them from the text. You are reading so much into the text to make it say what you want it to say. And so ultimately, these verses are speaking about two classes of beings, one human and one divine. But we'll get into that a bit more in a minute. So that is the Sethite view. That is the most popular view, the most common view that you will run into when looking at Genesis 6, 1 to 4.